6,000 miles from Goodyear's tenement. Africa, one of the world's great sources of natural resources. The Congo, 900,000 square miles. Over 2 billion rubber plants. Under brutal colonial rule. The heart of darkness. But one man will make a stand and change Africa's fate. And Sala. Rubber tapper. Husband. Family man. Alice Harris. Activist. Reformer. A Baptist missionary from Britain. And Sala doesn't know her, but has nowhere else to turn. He wants the world to know what he's carrying. What? What happened? Like all my batunyoso. The severed hand and foot of his daughter. The previous day, his village was attacked. His wife and daughter slaughtered. I'm going to help you, okay? Let me help you. For 19 years, Belgium's King Leopold has run the Congo as his own private estate. Millions forced to tap rubber. The profits line his pockets. Since there was nobody looking over his shoulder, he uh, exploited it and exploited the people as well. Almost anything could happen, and anything did, unfortunately. When workers don't make their quota, the shikan, a whip made from hippopotamus hide, 10 million Congolese die in 15 years of Leopold's rule. An African genocide. Just move that one hand a little bit closer. Alice Harris will expose the brutality of Leopold's regime and shift world opinion. A photograph that will change mankind. Baringa Province, Northeastern Congo. A land controlled by Belgium's King Leopold. British missionary Alice Harris will harness the power of mass communication to reveal a terrible truth. A catalog of horror. Our mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, beaten and murdered for rubber. No matter how hard we work, we suffer. Every day, we suffer. It's a story repeated through the ages. Colonial forces attack native populations and plunder the planet's riches. Atrocities committed far from prying eyes. Come on. Come on. 
Harris wants to change that. She'll tell the world what is happening in the Congo. That children are routinely maimed as a warning to villagers. Her weapon, the camera. For the first time, mankind can capture images of our world, reproduce and share them. The first cameras weighed 110 pounds. By 1900, they're smaller, portable, and in the hands of two million amateurs. The invention of photography and the means to get them in front of people held more power than its inventors ever dreamed. Photos don't blink and they don't go away. Once you've seen that image, you can't rewind. Harris takes hundreds of photos in the Congo. They're published in newspapers across the world, shocking millions of readers, including Mark Twain. If only we could bring home that picture to the minds of the American people how they would rise to destroy that age brutal trafficking in human flesh. Twain joins the Congo Reform Association to campaign against the atrocities. He writes pamphlets illustrated with Harris's photographs. Just one look at what had happened to these people in the Congo from these photographs she took was able to communicate so broadly and so horrifically that it transformed world opinion and it changed society. The campaign forces King Leopold to quit the Congo and the rubber trade. Mass media a new power in a modern world. Key to illuminating the planet's darkest corners. The expression, a picture's worth a thousand words, that's a lowball estimate. A picture, a, a good picture, is worth so much more than that. social Darwinism, a view of America that says there isn't a problem that be, can't be solved by making sure that the rich get richer and the poor get poor. It requires no sacrifice on the part of those of us who've won life's lottery and doesn't consider who our parents were or the education received or the right breaks that came at the right time. Today at a time when American families are facing more risk and greater insecurity than they ever have in recent history. A time when they have fewer resources and a weaker safety net to protect them against those insecurities. People of all backgrounds in America want a nation where we share life risks and rewards with each other. And when they make laws that will spread this opportunity to all who are willing to work for it, they expect our judges to uphold these laws, not tear them down because of their political elections. Six October, eighteen eighty six, Newport, Rhode Island. The U.S. Navy establishes the Naval War College to develop ideas and strategies for naval warfare and appoints Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan as one of four faculty members. It proves to be a fortuitous event. Mahan, who had plenty of practical experience aboard ship during the Civil War, possessed a superior analytical mind, perfectly suited to strategic thinking. 
He struck up a friendship with a visiting lecturer named Theodore Roosevelt and soon became famous for the scope of his strategic thinking and influence on naval leaders worldwide. He organized his lectures into a number of books that were received to great acclaim, especially The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. After two terms as president of the Naval War College, he retired a captain, but was promoted to Rear Admiral by an act of Congress. A class of destroyers bears the name of Rear Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan, the world's foremost theorist of military sea power, whose considerable intellect served his nation so well. In 1898, the United States declared war on Spain. 40,000 American troops landed on the island of Cuba, a Spanish colony. Cuba has been suspected 
for decades as being the source of the yellow fever that comes into the United States. It's an endemic disease in Cuba. It's always there. And that raises all sorts of fears. There's fears about soldiers and becoming infected in Cuba. There's fears about soldiers returning from Cuba and bringing yellow fever with them. It really opens up a whole new pathway for yellow fever to infect the United States. In only three months, the American army defeated Spain and occupied Cuba. Fewer than 400 American soldiers were lost to Spanish bullets, but more than 2,000 came down with Yellow Jack. An African-American regiment, the 24th Infantry, lost a third of its men to the disease. Two years into the occupation, a yellow fever epidemic raged across the island. The lives of 15,000 American troops were at risk. Because they didn't understand the role of the mosquito, what they would do is someone would catch yellow fever, they'd be put in a, in a hospital next to someone who had malaria, next to someone else who had typhus. Meanwhile, there are mosquitoes buzzing around them, biting one, biting the other, spreading disease back and forth. We thought that it was transmitted by fomites. Uh, fomite was any inanimate object that could transmit uh, an illness. And so there was felt to be something on the clothes, on the furniture, the sheets that the sick people slept on. There was felt to be something in those materials that could transmit the disease. In July 1900, an outbreak of yellow fever was reported at a U.S. camp just west of Havana. American troops now faced the same danger as other armies who had ventured into the region. Yellow fever had been the enemy of colonial powers in the Caribbean for a long time. It had destroyed an army that Napoleon sent to Haiti in 1802. And in the 1890s, it had devastated Spanish armies in Cuba. Americans were well aware of all of this, so they were very fearful that their armies in Cuba not suffer the same way. This is Puerto Rico on a calm night in July 2017. Here it is again after Hurricane Maria in September. The storm's impact has been catastrophic. It was at its strongest when it was passing over the most populated parts of the island, which is home to about 3.4 million people. It knocked off Puerto Rico's power grid, and now it'll be months before most of the island has electricity again. And what's made recovery particularly hard is that the government has no money. That's partly because of its complex relationship with the U.S. mainland. Puerto Rico became a U.S. Commonwealth in 1952, but nearly half of all Americans don't know that people born in Puerto Rico are U.S. citizens. The island's economic downturn can be traced back to the 1960s and 70s, when a special tax break from Congress led U.S. companies to set up shop in Puerto Rico. Then, between 1993 and 2006, Congress phased out those tax breaks, and companies left the island in droves, taking thousands of jobs with them. Economic growth slowed to a crawl, and hordes of people started leaving the island. The number of Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. mainland doubled between 2005 and 2015. And as the tax base shrank, Puerto Rico went into massive debt to pay its bills. Today, it owes more than $70 billion, mostly to Wall Street creditors. In May of 2017, the island filed for protection similar to bankruptcy. Budgets for hospitals, schools, and roads were slashed. Another U.S. policy that led to Puerto Rico's economic turmoil is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, or the Jones Act. It places huge tariffs on any foreign imports. Although President Trump suspended the Jones Act in the wake of Hurricane Maria, those costs have been passed down to Puerto Ricans for decades. Since Puerto Rico imports 84% of its food, people there often pay double what they would on the mainland for basic necessities. 
The high cost of living is one of the reasons 43% of residents live in poverty. Crucially, the island's financial woes have kept it from investing in the kind of modern, automated power plant technology that's characteristic of the mainland U.S., and that's going to make recovery difficult. Most power plants on the mainland rely on natural gas, with some coal, nuclear, and renewables. But Puerto Rico's old-fashioned plants still generate two-thirds of their power from burning oil, and all that oil has to be imported. In the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, the power plants are mostly intact, but nearly 80% of the transmission lines that carry power are down, and so are the roads that bring oil to the power plants. While the island's power plants are on the southern coast, most people live in the north, and between those two sit dense forests and mountains. Apart from the challenging terrain, Puerto Rico's electric utility company, Prepa, relies heavily on workers with extensive knowledge, and those workers have been leaving. Since 2012, 30% of Prepa's employees have retired or left for the mainland in search of better jobs. Electrical engineers from Puerto Rico can make about 27% more money on the U.S. mainland. According to its director, Prepa is on the verge of collapse because there's no personnel to operate it. And that was before the storm. Without technicians to repair all of these broken transmission lines, Puerto Ricans are expected to be without power for months. And the consequences could be dire. Without electricity to pump water into homes, it's difficult to find clean water for drinking and bathing. No air conditioning or fans can mean increased risk of heat stroke. And without refrigeration to keep insulin and other drugs from expiring, people are at risk of death. All of this means that millions of U.S. citizens, for the foreseeable future, will be living in conditions that we usually associate with places very far away. America had aspirations of becoming a world power, and to do so, she would need coal refueling stations on islands such as Puerto Rico. American politicians believed war was now inevitable, allocating $50 million of additional funding to the military, and with the backing of the United States Congress, the president issued an ultimatum to the Spanish government, leave Cuba. The Spanish did not accept, expelling US diplomats from Madrid and severing ties. The two nations were at war. American forces quickly occupied Spain's New World holdings, the Philippines and Guam in the Pacific, and Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Caribbean. In just under three months, Spain sued for peace. The war would formally end with the Treaty of Paris. Cuba became independent, but as a protectorate of the United States, and Spain ceded the Philippines, Guam, and crucially for our story, Puerto Rico to the control of the United States as spoils of war. But the white political establishment didn't want Puerto Rico, a place of color, to become a state. Puerto Rico has been under U.S. control since the Spanish-American War in 1898. Puerto Ricans were granted U.S. citizenship and the ability to serve in the military. However, those who live on the island are unable to vote in the presidential elections and do not pay federal taxes. The territory has its own government that is subject to the jurisdiction and sovereignty of the U.S. Currently, Puerto Rico has a single non-voting delegate in Congress. The history of American imperialism dates back as far as the Founding Fathers do when Thomas Jefferson stated that he was waiting for the fall of the Spanish Empire until our population can be sufficiently advanced to gain it from them piece by piece. When Mexico successfully gained its independence, it wasn't long before the U.S. found the American Southwest in its hands after a war with the new country. Nearly 50 years later, after the U.S. successfully defeated Spain in 1898, Jefferson's prophecy would once again come into play. One of the results of the Spanish-American War was that several Spanish colonies fell into American hands. Two of these were Cuba and the Philippines. And while the U.S. made it clear that it wouldn't keep Cuba, the story of the Philippines was a bit different. <laughs> Hi everyone, Thought Monkey here, and today I'll be talking about the Philippine-American War. 
The Philippines is a nation made up of many islands. During the age of exploration in the 16th century, the Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan arrived on the islands and claimed them for Spain. Over the next 400 years, the Filipino people were subjugated to the rule of Spain, which had some ups and a lot of downs. Even before the U.S. went to war with Spain and took possession of the Philippines, Filipino revolutionaries had already been struggling for independence from the big, bad Spanish Empire. And while at first many of them believed that the Americans were coming to liberate them from Spanish rule, it was clear that when they didn't allow the general of the revolutionary forces, Emilio Aguinaldo and his troops to march to Manila alongside American troops, that the U.S. had other ideas in mind. In October of 1898, a conference was held to determine the fate of the Philippines. The Americans were given three choices, to hand the islands back to Spain, to give the Philippines its independence, or to annex the territory. While many anti-imperialist Americans were against annexation and quoted President Lincoln when he said, no man is good enough to govern another man without the other's consent, the fact is that those in power held a different view of the Philippines. President William McKinley believed that it was God's will for Americans to uplift and civilize and Christianize them, and believed that they were unfit for self-government. And finally, he believed that it would leave a power vacuum of which Germany or other rival countries may be quick to fill. On February 6, 1899, the treaty to annex went before the U.S. and passed by one vote. The Philippines now belong to the Americans. While the treaty was passed in the U.S., the Filipino revolutionaries were not quite happy with the idea. Fighting quickly erupted and by June 2, 1899, the First Philippine Republic officially declared war against the United States. The war lasted three years and the U.S. found victory. The Philippines were devastated by the war as it caused a breakdown in its infrastructure causing hunger, disease, and displacement. Ultimately, an estimated 34,000 to 220,000 Filipinos were either injured or killed. The Roman Catholic Church was de-established as a state church and English became the primary language among the government, business, and education. While the official war was over, fighting between different revolutionary groups in the Philippines and American forces continued for more than 10 years. The issue was not necessarily that the U.S. wasn't going to grant the Filipinos independence, but more about when and under what conditions. In July of 1902, the Philippine Organic Act stated that upon peace, a legislative government would be created containing a lower house which would be popularly elected by Filipinos and an upper house which would be appointed by the President of the United States. At home in the U.S., the public tended to consider the annexation of the Philippines as expensive and something that brought little profit. Moreover, Teddy Roosevelt said as early as 1901 that he wanted the Philippines to be able to self-govern, and by 1907 he said that he was ready to figure out a way to give the islands their independence. By 1916, the Jones Act was passed promising the eventual independence of the islands and created an elected Philippine Senate. And in the 1919 presidential election, Woodrow Wilson stated that his intention was to deprive ourselves of that frontier, the Philippines. In 1934, another act was signed promising Filipino independence in 10 years, but because of World War II, there was a two-year delay and the United States finally granted the Philippines independence in 1946. The question remains, however, did the U.S. do the right thing when it annexed the Philippines over 100 years ago? If the Philippines hadn't been annexed, would they have been colonized by another global player? Who really knows? If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to stay updated with the latest ThoughtMonkey video. Thank you.